Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to this last episode of ACNS webinar in the year 2023. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Egypt, Professor Sameh Al Mori Hassan. Dr. Sameh is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Wadi Al Nil Hospital and Kaiser Al Aini Hospital, Cairo, Egypt. His specialty of interest is spine, especially endoscopic spine surgeries and brain surgeries. Also, he is also chairman of the World Federation of Spine endoscopy and he's also the president of the Middle East Brain Initiative and N20 board member for the brain mapping and therapeutics. He's a person who has played a significant part in the online education of neurosurgeons around the world and we're extremely honored to have him today with us and he'll be talking about the dilemma in the management of spondylolisthesis is it stable or not. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honorable guest from India, Professor Arivargan A. Professor Ari Vargan is a professor of neurosurgery at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore, India. His clinical interests are focused upon neuroendoscopy, both transcranial and skull based, molecular genetics, and epilepsy surgery and functional neurosurgery as well. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars, and today he will be talking about disconnection surgeries in drug resistant epilepsy. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honorable guest from Pakistan, Professor Salman Sharif. Professor Sharif is the chief of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Liaquat National Hospital and Medical College, Institute of Postgraduate Studies and Medical Sciences, Karachi, Pakistan. He is a co chair of the Spine committee of WFNS is the president of the World Spinal Column Society, who was the past president of the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons. He is an executive and education committee member of the ACNS and WFNS endoscopic committee member. He has also been a torchbearer for online education for the young neurosurgeons in his country. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Dr. Sameh Hassan. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honorable guest from Belgium, Professor Christian Raftopoulos. Professor Raftopoulos is the chairman of neurosurgery and neurosciences at the Chirac Delta Group Hospitals, Brussels. He was the previous chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at St. Luke University Hospitals, Brussels. His scientific contribution includes the development, development of new classification of ICP waves and development of modified surgical techniques for KRM malformations, meningocils, and intracranial aneurysms. Currently, he is particularly involved in epilepsy surgery and new minimally invasive spinal techniques as well. His considerable work is reflected in more than 100 articles which he has authored and co authored. He was the past general secretary and president of the French language neurosurgical society. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and the one for audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Salman Sharif. All right. Thank you, Raja. I think, again, I'm grateful to ACNS for inviting us and in doing this great work. A uh, lot of interesting webinars going on. And I'm so happy that you know, we are continuing to uh, make a, an impression for all the young neurosurgeons worldwide. Um, today, a wonderful, I, I have a very good friend of mine, uh, Asan Al Mursi, and you know, he's a, an amazing um, spine surgeon, uh, does a lot of effort regarding education worldwide. He's going to be talking about uh, spondylolisthesis uh, and the dilemma of um, stable or unstable. So uh, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Salman Sharif. Good day uh, for every one of you. Thank you, uh, dear friend uh, in ACNS, for inviting me to deliver uh, this lecture, especially my dear friend, Dr. Raja Kuti. I am uh, Samah al Musi from, from Egypt. No conflict on, on, of interest for this lecture and nothing to be disclosed. And my talk today will be about spondylolysis, the dilemma of management, is it stable or not, fused or not, with more discussion about it, its pathophysiological aspects and biomechanics. Most of us uh, as a spine surgeon believe that spondylolysis occurs because of instability and we should make fusion to gain stability at this level or levels. But if this is a fact, why we face in clinical practice some spondylolysis decrease proceed to more advanced degrees while others stay the same all the time? Why some sometimes it's okay on one level and sometimes it occurs on multiple levels? Why some cases discovered incidentally? Why we see intraoperative 
some are fused and others aren't without signs in preoperative images. Why in some symptomatic cases surgical correction doesn't give us the desirable outcome post-operatively? And this lecture will try to answer some questions and uh, some notes too. And I will start my talk by this statement. We are focusing on motion, but your construction will not fail because of motion. It fails because of excess loads. My agenda for today will include all these items. And we will start by definitions, which we will use throughout this lecture. Spondylus recesses originates from Greek roots. Spondylus means vertebrae. And Ulysses means slip. Spondylosis is a base defect. Spondylitosis is, is falling of the vertebra above down. Motion segment includes all articular tissues, the overlying spinal muscles, and segments content, the vertebral canal, intervertebral foramen, into a, and to all of these form a functional anatomical unit, which has been first suggested by Jugans. And so stability is, is the ability of the spine under physiological load to limit patterns of dis displacement so that the spinal cord and the nerve roots are not damaged or irritated and in addition to prevent participating deformity or being caused by structural changes. And so, so far, there is no consensus about this definition, which gives us the real picture of stability. Instability is the inability to limit excess or abnormal spinal displacement. And we need to differentiate instability from rigidity, because rigidity is stub of motion, but it doesn't mean it's stable. So if you have rigid construct or rigid fusion, that, this doesn't mean you have a stable spine. And this will lead us to the next definition of fusion. Fusion surgery is to connect two or more bones in any part of the spine. Connecting them prevent movement between them so that we are gained our best surgeries by rigid fusion, which is not necessarily the stable one. Moment a force is a measure of its tendency to cause a body to rotate about a specific point or axis. She force moving parallel, move over another parallel surface. Instability is categorized into acute and chronic. And acute includes over instability and limited instability. Chronic uh, includes glacial instability and dysfunctional segmental motion. The images shows over instability, but glacial doesn't appear even in MRIs. From my own point of view, the best comprehensive evidence-based review done about spondylolysis is one done by Evans 2018, which has changed my thinking about this disease. And as you see, he has assessment of instability in radiology and they said it doesn't mean that you have spondylolysis it means it's unstable. Wiltz has classified it according to pathophysiology into six types: congenital, ismic, 
ديجينيتيف توماتيك باثولوجيكال اند ياتوجينيك اند ايزميك انتو سب تايبز الونجيتد ليكيد ليتيك اند اكيوت وات اباوت انسدنس اوف ذيس ديزيز موست اوف الليتريتشر سيد اتس اباوت 6 بيرسنج اوف جينيرال بوبيوليشن ميل از مور ذان فيميل and the incidence under 6 years is about 2.6 we see and do examined 420 cadaveric specimen to find over all incidence of 4.2 lower prevalence in blacks more in ischemic population with rate of 13 in adolescents and 55 in adults The clinical syndrome first discovered, described by obstetrician Herbinski, Herbinosi, before understanding its pathophysiology. And he has discovered it by describing the prominence of anterior sacrum and impedant vaginal delivery. We, if we search about classifications of uh, Spondylolysis, we will see the upper hand go for my myoding classification because it's easy to handle it, but it doesn't require the level of clinicals because it doesn't take the other morphological parameters such as segmental kyphosis, disc height, into in consideration he has classified it by degree into five degrees and high degrees are more than 50 percentage there are other classifications and the proposal have been added to literature without popularity and a test to to know if uh, it's uh, more reliable or not but the research is which get, uh, which used it said it's uh, reliable and applicable to use but still the myoding is the most easiest one but it doesn't give us the clinical desire If we search about it, about the pathophysiology of uh, of spondylolysis, we will see there is no uncertain pathophysiology in all of literature. And they said always we don't un we don't understand this pathophysiology well. But spondylolysis is not only bony slippage, it's also disease of muscles, joints, capsules, and alignments. As muscles act like complex cantilever wires, capsule and joints and ligaments act as tunicae. So if you have any disease of this muscle, like myelolysis or fatty degeneration, this wire will become redundant. The distribution, attachment, and arrangement and axes of motion contribute in pathology of spondylolysis. Weakness, fatty degeneration, hyalinosis of muscle make the wires redundant, afford the load that have been afforded before. So the muscles and the capsule and the ligaments can't afford the loads that it can be afforded before. And there is heterogeneity. You can't say the bone is the, the responsible one for spondylolysis because this absorbs some of energy. Ligaments has uh, uh, ligaments and capsules 
have have um, a lot of bout on in this motion, and there is some differentiation between thoracic and spine uh, anatomical structure. Low doses will increase the the share energy. That's why spondylolisthesis occurs more in lumbar spine. The mainstay for assessing the dynamic instability and diffusion is still X-ray electroradiology, which include plain X-ray and CT. But you can't be sure of fusion unless you find no definitive separation between the two bodies, and this can't be happened till at least six months of your operation. And then you can say, I am sure I have solid rigidity at this region, but you don't guarantee stability for the spine. And this lead, lead us to revise some bi biomechanics to understand more. And what more relevant to our pathology are shear forces, moment, linear displacement, strain, and energy. Spine moves in multi-direction to perform the desired action, which is known as coupling. All components of spine are under control of energy deformation theory. So, if the applied energy absorbed by the tissue, no energy will happen. But if the energy is more than the deformity, the, the deformation, so energy comes. And to make it simpler, linear, linear goes through an axis and the body will transmit all linear through all vertebral bodies. Gravity will accelerate this force to be directed on the base of this force. And if you see these pictures on the left, you will find nearly the same energy have been admitted to both patients. But when you operate on them, you will not gain the same result because one will, will gain the, the desirable result and the other will fail because of failure of respecting biomechanics. On the right, on the other hand, if you see this picture, you will you will expect that patient to have no no issues to be done. It's a successful surgery. But over distraction that has been done over these discs have made this patient fails. And the direction of Screws, the material that you use in fixation of this patient, make more stresses over the other discs. That's why this patient fails and requires another intervention. Pain comes through, through if Surgery don't load sparing, not motion sparing. So when you do surgery, respect load sparing and don't say I have stopped the motion, so I have no pain and I have stability. And these concepts give 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 us the the basics of Dubuze concept, which is cone of economy. If you have less effort, so you will have no pathology. One of the most important concepts to be in your mind when you 
make your surgery is a sleep angle because sleep angle is one of the most momentum that give you an idea about the loads on this region and we reach the management section of uh, this lecture you have either conservative and if you fail you will go for surgery your aim of surgery will be decompressing neural tissues and restoring the alignment without more add on stresses because of if you don't respect these forces and stresses your construction will fail and the pain will gain we have multiple surgical options as we know like in situ of fusion and uh, if we search for more add-on from fusion or fixation we will find no specific based evidence in literature and uh, as you see in this uh, uh, publication they don't recommend fusion surgery as a first choice and they, they said there is a bias from some some roots they don't know what how bias came for literature at the end i will recommend for second time this uh, review to know more about surgical strategies uh, which will help you in planning for your surgery and this algorithm too in low grade spondylolysthesis but please be careful when you reduce for high grade because of 10 percent of you of your uh, patients will harm your neural tissue So we will go for take home messages. Spondylolysthesis is not the disease of just bony sliding. Still, we need more research to understand its pathophysiology more well. If you decided to operate your patient, think about using surgical strategy with at least stresses on your construct to not face failure. Fusion doesn't mean that you have got the stability for the spine. These are books that I have used to make this lecture. And these are also the publications that helped me in preparing of this lecture. And to be noticed, most of them are in recent future. A lot are in 2023, which mean we are still facing a problem that need to be solved. And thank you all for inviting me and for listening. Thank you. Good, uh, dear Sami, I think an excellent talk. Uh, basics were dealt with over here. And I'm very happy the way you have taken uh, the attitude of uh, finding out what are the basics and how we should go about uh, dealing with this condition. It's very common. We know this. The uh, main concern that I have uh, at the moment, looking a lot of people around me. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, we can take lesson from uh, this talk and learn. Um, so I'm grateful. Thank you, Raja. It was wonderful hearing this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Salman Shari for these wonderful comments and also excellent lecture, Dr. Sameh. Uh, uh, I thought you'll be dealing on more of sp uh, endoscopic reduction and fixation techniques <laughs> because that is your uh, favorite uh, surgeries, I know, having seen you from a long time. So if we can take a few questions from the audiences, yes, uh, my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Seng, any comments from you? Thanks, Raja. Thanks, Prof, for a very nice uh, lecture. I have two questions uh, for you, Prof. Uh, first of all, that uh, in uh, normal alignment of the spine, 
uh, endoscopic uh, technique, especially transforming the uh, uh, claim that the fifty percent removal of facet will not affect the stability. Uh, do you think the same uh, in spondylolithesis cases, whether it's still fifty percent or something else? Uh, my second question, Professor. Uh, in in the era now, you you mentioned that the muscle is very important in terms of stability. And do you oh, think? Probably, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you think that it's still valid now, it's still justice to do open technique where the MIS is already there uh, established? Thank you, Professor. I didn't hear the first question well, but I will answer the second question first. Yes, your, your wires that make your uh, spine more stable is uh, muscle. And uh, as a spine surgeon, we don't care for long decades about this issue. We even didn't study how to strengthen this muscle. If you have um, a cantilever and you have redundant uh, wire, you will search for another wire to replace. Or you have the way to uh, know how to strengthen your, uh, your wire. But in literature, you didn't find something like this to, to be needed. Yes, min I, I agree, minimal invasive will make us uh, more potent to make uh, more more uh, desirable uh, outcome for our patients but so far we we don't know when we hit the fibers what will be more affected if you uh, find the spine uh, if you study spine dynamics uh, more well you will find if you cut if you cut a, a, a muscle on one way and let it the, the the spine will shift to to another to the the opposite direction so uh, muscle is more important but how to how to strengthen it how to know how which which one is more important than the other and which uh, is uh, I, I have to preserve this one to not affect the stability of this patient still we don't know we need more research to know thank you uh, please yeah, yes, okay. thank you, Prof. My first question is about the uh, endoscopic uh, transforamina approach, where it claimed that the 50% removal of facet will not affect the stability. How about in cases of spondylolisthesis, whether the same uh, uh, applies for, for that? Thank you. I, I didn't say if we, uh, you, you in, in conventional surgery, you know, we have mesial facetectomy. So you have removed uh, the medial part of facet. Does it affect the stability or not? As I said in my lecture, we don't have consensus about stability definition. If you ask someone about the definitions that we read in literature, this is not con uh, applied on our uh, uh, patients uh, uh, 100%. That's why I criticize this uh, definition also. Stability doesn't mean you have rigid, you have rigid uh, fixation or rigid fusion. Rigid fusion doesn't mean your, your uh, spine is stable. The, uh, at, and this is, uh, you, you have find it in my take home message. Stability doesn't equal rigidity. This is bad and this is another bad. So if you, Cut medial or lateral 50 percentage of your facet. That doesn't mean you have you, you have make instability. If you have more research about it, please tell me about it. But in conventional, we have cut the medial medial facetectomy, and there's nothing happen to most of patient. Why does this is okay? There is no comparative studies in literature to uh, say to us this will go for mesial facetectomy and have instability, and this will go for mesial uh, uh, facetectomy and doesn't have it. I hope thank I you. can uh, answer your question. Yes, thank you, Professor. Well, thank you, thank you very much. We have Professor Ajit R. Yes, Dr. Ajit, you can ask your question. Uh, it, it is regarding uh, SPSG classification because uh, 
फाइव एंड सिक्स ग्रेड यूशली नीड रिडक्शन बिकॉज वन हाज गोट ए ग्रोस पेलविक इम्बालेंस अदर हाज गोट ए ग्रोस ग्लोबल इम्बालेंस सो मोस्ट ऑफ द केस वट वी डू वी मेषर आल दि लंबा लोड पेलविक टेल्थ then uh, about the uh, what is the uh, balance gravity line so all these things uh, helps in uh, getting a better outcome for the patient so do you think uh, for grade 5 and grade 6 measuring these parameters that is a uh, lumbar load is uh, pelvic tilt global balance and uh, circle slope and other is it necessary before uh, a work up before uh, doing high grade exercises that i mean grade 5 and 6 of the sdsc classification thank you dr uh, professor for your question i i have included in my literature uh, 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 the new classification and uh, as you see in the classification the aim of m- m- adding this classification to literature is to incorporate sagittal balance concept but if you if you the sagittal balance concept it doesn't uh, ha- uh, add to literature anything except more add for fusion and this is not tested well to see if this is a reliable concept or not it has been taken from retrospective and images from patients no prospective literature to assess this concept so if we build something on concept that we didn't test it well before uh, in prospective randomized controlled studies i can't answer your question uh, even for uh, other things also there is no uh, evidence so what we practice earlier there is no evidence because uh, a patient with a global imbalance uh, who was in a grade 5 grade 6 if you do a postural reduction he still continues to be in a global imbalance and he still has the symptoms okay a patient with a pelvic tilt to more than 26 or a 25 he has a he has his back muscles acting to correct the imbalance so that he will have a severe back pain even after you do simple correction so uh, I, the evidence means uh, this spsc is based on almost 1000 uh, analysis of 1000 cases so uh, it, it, we cannot say that it doesn't have any, any evidence well, i have proved in i said uh, isn't it <laughs> what process i may, meant that it hasn't been proved in an rct that's what he meant well anyways we can have a lot of discussion later in the part if uh, we will m- move on to Prof. So Sarif, for his esteemed comments and closure. Yes, I think it was a good discussion, and I totally agree that there is a lot of um, uh, you know vacuum in the literature. We have come up with uh, small studies, but no RCTs. So I think clearly the evidence we haven't been able to prove for anything actually. Yes, but uh, in this particular case, I think uh, what we are saying is that common sense is is the best way to go about things. So all the best, and uh, it was wonderful having you all. And Samir, I think you know, very very nice talk. Really enjoyed that. Thank you, thank, thank you, you very sir. much. You. So it was one indeed wonderful to have you, Samir, with us, and also Professor Masri with us. And now we'll move on to the second session. Prof. Ari Vargan has already joined us, so I will hand this podium over to our honourable Professor Christian Dr. Paulus for uh, starting this session. Enjoy the wonderful 
Okay, so let me share my screen. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, I thank the ACNS for giving me this opportunity to share my uh, whatever ideas and uh, few points about this procedure. So disconnection surgeries are a specific procedures in a group of patients with drugs and epilepsy. So let me just uh, give an idea about the basics and how it is done. What are the concepts? Where this and the surgery is indicated, and what are the types of techniques that we do? So uh, the basis for any surgery for a patient with drug resistant epilepsy is identification of the part of the brain that is causing the seizure, and there are so many definitions for the. uh areas they like to see in this table uh, the uh, it can be a functional zone or epileptogenic lesion but that can cause a more irritation around that which will be a wider irritative zone but what is most important is an epileptogenic zone which is a integral part of the brain which is cause which is the reason for the drug resistant epilepsy however the so this concept has moved from a zone or a focus uh, based uh, that physiology pathophysiology to now a network based after the advent of, and the more expansion of stereo eg so our this talk today is more of disconnection so when we talk about once we identified the epileptogenic focus uh, one has to decide to remove this focus whether a resection is uh, better or a disconnection is better a resection is usually and uh, considered whenever the lesion is small amenable for resection and can completely remove however every time we don't get the patients like that uh, patients can present with very large lesions sometimes involving more than one lobe and sometimes involving whole hemisphere wherein a complete resection of the lesion will be either not practical or can be very extensive in which case the disconnection is considered so to understand uh, how disconnection works we have to understand the network and the anatomy of what is being removed so the so the the pathophysiology or the uh, basis for surgery is the same if a particular part of the brain is causing a drug resistant epilepsy or a continuous multi repeated seizures despite medications any surgery is considered to remove that part if possible if not to disconnect that particular part of the brain from the other normal functioning brain so that the patient can have control of seizures as well as better quality of life there are three common uh, disconnection surgeries that are done in these patients uh, namely corpus callosotomy hemispheric disconnection and a postural cord disconnection i'm just going to describe all these three uh, specifically what are the indications how is it done and what is the outcome so the first is corpus callosotomy we all know we do corpus callosotomy uh, as an access to enter the ventricles but this is described for control of drug resistant epilepsy as early as 80 years ago and we all know that this corpus callosotomy is a major white matter bundle which uh connects uh, and runs between the two hemispheres and connects the hemispheres and it has been shown that a complete corpus callosotomy results in significant seizure uh, reduction how it exactly works is not clear but most likely the mechanism of seizure reduction is the interruption of the spread of epileptic impulses from one hemisphere to another thereby reducing the uh, seizures so the major indications for this type of surgery is uh, drop attacks mainly atonic seizures or secondary lenogenous gestor syndrome or in west syndrome so usually this surgery is considered as a kind of palliative procedure it is done for children who have multiple falls uh, mainly atonic seizures or they usually have multiple seizures uh, though even if there are even if there are multiple seizures uh, the atonic seizures are the ones which get controlled by the uh, surgery so understand the surgery we should understand the anatomy corpus callosum has got uh, rostrum genu and body and the splenium 
and uh, in corp- complete callosotomy the corpus callosum is is dissect, uh, disconnected from starting from rostrum to splenium as well as anterior and posterior uh, anterior commissure uh, and also we should understand the arterial and venous associations to this corpus callosum because we have to expose the uh, pericolosal artery and uh, we also should be aware of the ve- veins that are draining the suprasagittal sinus during the access so this is the uh, marked area is the one which is uh, disconnected during the surgery and uh, so the patient is usually positioned supine and an incision is made as shown in this picture across the midline uh, more anterior than posterior uh, straddling the coronal suture and uh, recently also Dr. Sarat Chandra from India has described uh, pure endoscopic technique to do the same and craniotomy can be an incision skin, skin incision can be different either you can make a, a square shaped incision or you can make a linear incision and uh, what is essential is exposure of the uh, midline, two-third anterior, one-third posterior. Uh, if you look at the scan, the total length of corpus callosum is somewhere from six to seven centimeters. But we really don't need that much amount of access at the level of the brain, at the level of the bone, because our uh, vision works like a funnel. So all you need a one or two centimeter window between the veins through which one can access the whole of corpus callosum. So this is a eight-year-old child who presented with secondary uh, lenoz jessau syndrome with multiple rock attacks causing repeated injuries. And this was MRI which shows uh, uh, typically uh, normal brain. Sometimes they can have uh, bilateral occipital gliosis. And there's a video which uh, shows the procedure. So after uh, craniotomy and exposing the uh, intermissal pressure, retracting the uh, cortex to one side, you can see the corpus callosum is exp- exposed. You can see the arteries, uh, pericolous arteries are shifted to both sides and incision is made and then dissected. And we reach the midline and not open the ventricle and pr- try to avoid opening the septum pellucidum as much as possible. Then go anterior and decompress the uh, genu. And uh, here you don't have to go beyond the arteries. You can see the uh, pericolosal artery A3 div- turning down to A2. The point is to completely uh, do the uh, disconnection and expose the whole A2, A3 uh, curved genu. And after that, the in, uh, me- uh, deeper part of the uh, genu is disconnected and the anterior commissure autonomy is done, connecting that to the septum of the ventricle. And once that is done, posteriorly the corpus cluster body ex- is extended as far away as splenium. Uh, one can use navigation to be in initial uh, cases. It'll be difficult to exactly identify where when the splenium ends because if you remember in scan, the splenium is uh, that bends down posterior as low as possible. You can take navigation assistance. The key is to connect the ependyma of the th- uh, third ventricular roof to the pi arachnoid of the intermissary pressure so that you can ensure a complete corpus callosotomy. Once corpus callosotomy is done, you can close the dura and. Uh, Looking at the outcomes, if you see, this corpus callosotomy is a good surgery in the correct indications. You can see you, you can achieve more than 70 to 80 percent control of drop attacks. In addition to control of drop attacks, these children also have control of other type of seizures and they also show improvement in their cognitive functions beyond uh, after the control of seizures. They can have development and they can have a, a progression of the milestones after the control of seizures, sometimes reduction in size. And this uh, so that is regarding corpus callosotomy. Coming next to hemispherotomy, it's a different. Uh, it's a. It's a. Here, the, this procedure is indicated when uh, the pathology is involving more than two to three lobes, or sometimes uh, the whole hemisphere. There are different types of hemispherotomy described. Uh, when is perisylvian technique described by Velimur, Jean Velimur, or vertical parasitical hemispherotomy described by Delalande, and recently endoscopic hemispherotomy described by Dr. Sarat Chandra. Essentially. The only difference is the mode of entry into the lateral ventricle. All the fibers that need to be disconnected are the same in both the procedures. Uh, there may be preservation of insula in case of vertical, but when the insula may have to be removed in case of lateral. And again, in case of uh, pericyl hemispherotomy, temporal lobectomy is done, whereas in case of uh, vertical hemispherotomy, it is sufficient to just disconnect the hippocampal fibers. So, as I mentioned earlier, the indications for this particular procedure is when the lesion or the pathology or the epileptogenic focus involves a whole hemisphere and it may be progressive like in case of Rasmussen's or it may be static in case of uh, uh, perinatal gliosis uh, conditions. So, these are the common indications like Rasmussen encephalitis, infantile hemiplegia syndrome, hemimegalencephaly, 
or Stooge Weber syndrome, gliosis, uh, which may require a hemispherotomy for control of seizures. The prerequisite, what needs to be remembered is this is a surgery which is morbid. This surgery can and will result in hemiplegia in most cases, which improves over a period of two to three months. And even if it improves, the pincer grafts, the distal weakness, the distal movements of the upper limb and lower limb will not improve after the surgery. And yeah, language can be affected if it, uh, if the surgery is done in the dominant side. Uh, if the insult uh, happened later in life, that is, if the language is already uh, lateralized to one, the, say that hemisphere, then it can cause uh, language deficit. And that can be one of the contraindications for the surgery in that particular case. So this uh, schematic diagrams shows the two types of common technique that is done. The lateral hemispherotomy perisylvan is uh, done from the lateral side exposing uh, the, through the uh, on through a supra and infra insular window whereas the vertical facial hemispherotomy is done through the frontal uh, gyrus entering the ventricle from the top and doing the disconnection so again this diagram shows the various cuts that are done the green ones are the vertical passive hemispherotomy surgery the blue ones is a for a lateral perisylvian hemispherotomy these are the various cuts that are done through the white matter fibers to have a complete disconnection of all the gray matter of the all the four loops frontal parietal occipital temporal and insula which results in disconnection of all the cortical fibers whereas if you can see the the central uh, nuclei and the central uh, structures like thalamus, caudate uh, and basal ganglia will still continue to have connection to the brainstem. That is what is very important. Uh, so I'll, sh I'll show a few cases. This is a, 12, uh, a child who had seizure from uh, 12 years of age uh, with right upper and lower limb uh, jerky movements, has multiple episodes, 20 episodes per day and also has uh, right upper and lower limb weakness since birth following perinatal asphyxia. An examination showed hemiparesis on the right side, 3 and 4 by 5. And this scan shows, uh, uh, this MRI shows extensive uh, fibrosis involving frontoparietal and as well as temporal lobes uh, as an indication of a perinatal insult resulting in ischemic injury. And uh, a PET MR shows significant hypermetabolism on the uh, left side. Uh, if FMRI shows language is lateralized to the right side. Therefore, this patient can be considered for hemispherotomy without much uh, uh, risk of uh, any language deficit. MRI showed uh, all these findings. And th this patient's video AG showed a significant uh, irritative zone uh, localizing to left hemisphere, extra temporal, probably frontal region. So, and this patient's MEG shows uh, a, a significant uh, source localization with uh, clusters of EC, uh, uh, with clusters on the left hemisphere around the Perisylvian region. In MEG, right is right and le uh, left is left. So this patient underwent vertical parasitical functional hemispherotomy. The component of this surgery is first central cortex resection, then uh, that is the posterior frontal region. Uh, then after that, we enter the ventricle and then do a anterior colostomy uh, through the ventricle. And then this is extended anteriorly and basally to uh, to uh, to uh, produce a frontobasal disconnection. Then a lateral cut is made. Uh, from the uh, posterior temporal horn and uh, up to the uh, through uh, through the medial to the insula and later to the basal ganglia to reach the cilium fissure, which results in insular and temporobasal disconnection. Finally, a posterior colostomy and paratospital disconnection is done. Let me see if I can show the video. Uh, this may be difficult to understand. Uh, to get oriented to the brain. So this is the left side brain. Uh, first, a central cortex resection, a small part of the frontal lobe uh, cortex is resected. Once it is resected, we uh, we go through the white matter and enter the ventricle. Uh, if the ventricle is large, it is easy, like in this case. Sometimes the ventricles may be small, like in the Magellan Caffelli. So the key is to open the ventricle so that the foramen of Monroe as well as the atrium is seen in single, so that this much amount of exposure of ventricle is required. Once that is done, the medial side on the septum uh, the septum, uh, uh, the just above the septum, the corpus callosum is open to identify the anterior cerebral artery. Once anterior cerebral artery, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is superior, this is uh, inferior. Once anterior callosotomy, the ident the uh, ACI is identified to take uh, to take, uh, and then the callosotomy, like I showed in the previous video, is done. Then frontobasal disconnection is done, where the cut is taken down all the way down to the ACF base, and then the ACA can be traced down. Uh, like in this case, you can see this is a frontobasal disconnection where the the cut is uh, taken down all the way down to the ACF base so that uh, the bone can be felt. 
all these surgeries one should remember the or the key is is to cut the white matter fibers and not vessels so if you see everywhere the pia is preserved and all the vessels are beyond the pia so one need not have to coagulate vessels at all in this surgery in most cases uh, the key in surgery is to disconnect the brain and not coagulate the vessels so once the colostomy is done here you can see from the atrium posteriorly i'm making a cut uh, lateral to insula medial to the bulge of the thalamus and this cut is uh, taken uh, extended uh, anteriorly uh, towards the region of the cilian fissure and then uh, the roof of the temporal horn is opened progressively to reach the cilian fissure region where the mca you can see the mca is exposed and then this cut the temporal horn as it you can see the temporal horn is opened this is the hippocampus this is the choroid plexus and then the uh, uh temporal pole is removed uh, so that this mcf cut is this uh, cut is taken down all the way to mcf base amygdala is removed as well as the hippocampus is disconnected at the level of the tail which results in hippocampal disconnection so this is where the fimbria of the hippocampus is removed i usually uh, do a uh, uh, hippocampal removal though this is not usually done many people do i, I do a part of uh, hippocampal resection so that the disconnection here is a uh, complex so you can see this uh, head and body of the hippocampus is being is being uh, resected and that's hippocampal uh, pia of the hippocampal sulcus so that is removal of the hippocampus and that is the uh, mcf base so we started from the periatrial region all the way down the cut is made to disconnect the insula and then the cut is taken down to mcf base and removal of the hippocampus so once that is done this is posterior where we can uh, do the posterior colostomy and take it down and connect it to the uh, fissure at the level of the choroid plexus at the atrium so you can see this uh, this is a choroid plexus of the atrium and then this is the uh, uh, fissure and then this disconnects all the fibers of the uh, paratoxpital lobe so this completes the vertical facetal hemispherotomy and this is a post op scan you can see the cut came all the way from there and we went laterally the cut goes uh, medial to the insula and lateral to the uh, thalamus all the way down to the temporal horn and then down to the mcf base this come this is scan done at post op day 2 and this is uh, scan at 3 months this patient had complete control of seizures uh, second type of uh, surgery is uh, second type of surgery is uh, uh, the uh, perisylvian hemispherotomy this is a 8 year old child again with uh, uncontrolled seizures diagnosed as rasmussen encephal encephalitis treated with iv steroids initially uh, you can see uh, over a period of one year there's a progressive atrophy of the right hemisphere with atrophy of the temporal uh, hippocampus dilatation of temporal horn and this one year later you can see significant atrophy compared to the uh, 2021 scan of the right hemisphere with dilatation of the ventricles so this is a case of rasmussen encephalitis you can see pet ct shows significant hypermetabolism of the whole right hemisphere uh, and uh, pet M, uh, pet mr uh, brain shows again significant hypermetabolism of the whole right hemisphere uh, suggesting involvement of the whole hemisphere and video eg in this case showed again right frontocentral region epileptogenic focus and mg as you can see there is significant clusters mec clusters of uh, of the uh, right hemisphere both at the frontal and temporal lobes so this patient underwent a perisylvian functional hemispherotomy again technique is slightly different the con the, uh, the uh, components are the same here instead of just doing temporal uh, hippocampal disconnection and first step is to do anterior temporal lobectomy and hippocampectomy then central glottis resection followed by anterior colostomy and frontobosal disconnection then do a uh, colostomy posterior to complete the disconnection finally do an insula disconnection or a resection so here uh, the right side surgery right frontal temporal craniotomy is done then first temporal horn is opened and uh, to identify the temporal horn then if i usually if the ventricles are small i usually before i do temporal lobectomy i also make a i do the central cortex resection so that the entry into uh, let temporal uh, lateral ventricle is easier if uh, if you do a temporal lobectomy and then vent csf drains out then uh, trying to get into the ventricle may be difficult so again uh, both temporal horn and lateral ventricle is entered uh then uh, temporal lobectomy is done after temporal lobectomy hippocampus is exposed then after uh, this is after doing a uh, amygdala hippocampectomy so uh, these are the, this is a cilian fissure with all the veins there this is frontal then once temporal lobectomy is done we enter the lateral ventricle and then do anterior colostomy you can see the uh, 
periclosal artery exposed uh, through the callosal incision this is this is this callosotomy is continued anteriorly uh, to make a complete corpus callosotomy you can see that the whole aca is exposed around the genu of the corpus callosum and then it is traced down into the uh, floor of the uh, uh, frontal basal structure all the way down so that this disconnection completes the frontal basal disconnection after which we do a posterior uh, paratoxical disconnection where you have to do a lateral uh, disconnection uh, around the uh, uh, insula posteriorly once that is done you have to do a medial disconnection through and through uh, so that the complete parietal lobe is paratoxical uh, lobe is disconnection and uh, once that is done you can see the uh, insula disconnection this is where you have to remove the insula and this is the scan post op which shows uh, like i said various cuts uh, through the lateral in, uh, cut then you can see the cut at the frontal basal disconnection this is a cut involving the posterior disconnection completing the surgery and this is a child this is i'm uh, showing you specifically products with so much of disconnection uh, this is the follow up at 3 month where the children these patients usually improve they have a, they produce they develop hemiplegia post op uh, some of them may still have some residual uh, power but most of them will be hemiplegic but with aggressive rehabilitation by 3 months uh, you can notice that the distal uh, finger movement is not there similarly the foot movement is not there however they will all be ambulant uh, at 3 months with control of sign which is very important for uh, at, when we look at the quality of life so these are the uh, outcome after the surgery where you can see that in selected cases 83% of them can be very ambulant and you can have a, a nearly 90% seizure control after the surgery and there are other various uh, uh, quality of life measures which also improve after the surgery including the language skills and uh, in this paper they in fact showed that patient not only improved in seizure control but also in their functional uh, ability like in going back to school getting jobs and all that the last te technique is a posterior quadrant disconnection this is uh, this is one of the rare among these because the indications are very selective you should have a condition which is uh, not uh, small enough to be to be go for resection at the same time it is large enough involving parietal or, or temporal and or temporal occipital lobe so that uh, a disconnection can be done involving only these three lobes pairing the motor cortex as well as the frontal lobe if in these kind of conditions then uh this surgery can be done but here you have to remember this is usually considered in a static condition because if it's a progressive disease one will not be sure whether it is uh, going to involve the motor cortex or fr frontal lobe later and this is considered usually when two or more lobes among temporal parietal occipital lobe is consider is involved and very important this patient should have functional preserved preop because if it's already involved uh, weakness involved suggesting uh, fr frontal and central lobe cortex involvement then this surgery will not work again there are various techniques where it is complete posterior quadrant disconnection other one is peri um, posterior uh, uh, quadrant te uh, tectomy where it is this, uh, this is tectomy the third one is a pipd where this is a posterior quadrant disconnection so the key is the posterior disconnection runs just behind the sensory cortex and uh, one needs to identify the central circles during surgery so that uh, the, sur the surgery is complete at the same time it does not cause a deficit so uh, it will be very useful if uh, a neuro navigation is available and sscp can be done to identify the central circles during uh, surgery as well as you can do stimulation however uh, as uh, experience comes one will be able to identify that by anatomy as well as neuro navigation so this is a case example of a 8 year old girl who did not have a motor deficit and you can have extensive uh, gliosis involving only the parietal occipital and temporal uh, region and uh, you can see that the uh, fmri showed motor function just in front of the gliotic area so i'll just show you a short video uh, so so here again the uh, temporal lobectomy is done first and after that a lateral uh, inc incision is made along the junction between the posterior uh, in the parietal lobe it should be just behind the sensory cortex and once that incision is made the the uh, disconnection is done uh, again through the ventricle ventricle is an important anatomical structure and guide for all the surgeries uh, epilepsy surgeries you have to keep the ventricle and through the ventricle the disconnection of the uh, fibers are done all the white matters are cut on both sides of the 
through uh, on the ciliary fissure you can see the vein of labia that is going down so the disconnection is pro uh, is is pro progressed through the same incision and white matter is cut and as you extend the incision it will take you to the uh, midline you can see this incision is curved along the gyrus and this is the sensory cortex so we are just behind the sensory cortex so here as you go superiorly you will reach the midline just under the uh, dural incision and you don't have to cut the dura all the way to midline you can work subpiely again like i told in the hemispherotomy here uh, the key is to cut the brain and white matter and not to coagulate or cut any artery or vein so we can always preserve all these structures so that the vascularity is preserved and uh, uh, do the surgery by preserving pia so once that uh, lateral disconnection is done as i showed you here the medial disconnection is uh, done along with that see, uh, where this uh, cut which we brought down to uh, to the midline the same the incision is taken down through the medial wall of the lateral ventricle you can see this uh, uh, atrium this is a uh, coronary plexus so the, in, the the incision is made on the medial surface of the lateral ventricle and this is deepened down all the way down initially you can see the fox which will be which will be our uh, uh, guide uh, and once you reach the uh, tip of the uh, to the medial um, uh, border of the fox uh, in inferior border of the fox then it, then the, then the disconnection is taken down inferiorly around the region of the splenium and then the uh, like i said in the previous uh, case hemispherotomy it is brought down and joined to the uh, choroidal fissure just below the level of the uh, just below the level of the atrium again you see medial structures are exposed and the pia is preserved so that we don't transgress there otherwise if we transgress we'll enter the region of the uh, internal cerebral vein uh, and quadrigeminal system and ambient system which is uh, best avoided by preserving the pia all along medially so this is a post op uh, uh, mri shows the cut again like you can see this temporal lobectomy is done and then the cut is made uh, medially which takes it all the way to the level of the fox and which is brought down here you can see this is a lateral this is a lateral disconnection through the ventricle the medial disconnection is taken all the way down here to the level of the choroidal fissure so uh, key is sometimes this space because we are doing this this patient will develop a uh, hemianopia post op that's something which we need to remember like i said these patients are usually uh, without any motor deficits but visual de deficit is something which has to be remembered and they have to be evaluated for visual field deficit if it is already present then it is good then you don't have to worry about, uh, it will not uh, it will show that that particular brain is involved so it facilitate decision at the same time you will not give an added def uh, deficit however in sometimes uh, they have an uh, the in young children especially the mr it will be very difficult to assess or in sometimes if the vision is normal then we have to explain this in detail to the patient uh, the before surgery to the relatives that this surgery will result in a homonymous hemianopia again a uh, language also can be a problem because we are going to go around the perisylvian regions uh, usually uh, patients do not develop a language deficit but one has to remember if you are doing it on the dominant side that this can be a, a problem sometimes so uh, coming to the outcome this is uh, our paper which we published uh, two years ago uh, in our series we had at last follow up uh, nearly two third of them have had complete control of seizures at angles 1a if you take all the uh, uh at various uh, uh, follow up years and uh, we also noted in our series most of the patients had uh, 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 one of, most of the patients or the most common condition was a gliosis uh, again and uh, we found that birth asphyxia actually was one of the uh, if it is present actually because we know that it's involved it can have a, a poorer uh, outcome and the various papers have published like you said this is a uh, uh, data from various series and you can see that since selected patients and uh, the outcome can reach up to 90% class 1 angles outcome and uh, as you see the numbers are not very large because this is again like i said before these are not common conditions so to conclude as a take home message uh, though there are different surgeries for drug resistant epilepsy this is 
uh, a specific type of surgery done for a select indication of these patients. So disconnective surgeries, what is important is to have a careful selection of patients and meticulous pre-surgical evaluation and detailed counseling is very important for this patient and parents because some of them can cause deficit. But what and what is most important is these are patients who do not have control of seizures and have everyday seizures for 20-30 times. But after the surgery, more than 80% of them can have very good seizure control and nearly 60-80% can have complete seizure freedom thereby uh, causing reduction or stoppage of uh, medications and an aggressive rehabilitation can help them to get back into their life and um, assimilate with the uh, society. And corpus callosum is specifically a very important and useful surgery specifically uh, for patients who have drop attacks because it gives excellent outcome for that particular condition. Thank you. This is our team where uh, uh, we have neurosurgeons and neurologists, psychologists, radiologists, as well as neuropathologists. Uh, we have more. The, we have this uh, epilepsy surgery program, which uh, uh, which goes in our department, in our in, in our institute, where patients are systematically worked up and then they report for surgery and uh, followed up by all of us together uh, for more than two decades. Thank you. I would like to two ways of performing a uh, hemispherotomy, the lateral way, the vertical way. Uh, now, as it chosen, a way to perform is hemispherotomy, first one, and on average, uh, one, he performs a hemispherotomy. Personally, I do only vertical hemispherotomy. What are the results regarding class one? Which percentage of class one do you have? Which percentage of acute hydrocephalus do you have? And which percentage of chronic hydrocephalus after surgery do you have? Uh, I hope I got your questions right, Dr. Raptopoulos. I uh, think because the initial part of your uh, uh, conversation was not clear. So I will just answer the last two questions and I hope we'll go back and so regarding the hydrocephalus after hemispherotomy, uh, like you know, even from literature, once we moved from hemispherectomy to hemispherotomy, the incidence of hydrocephalus is very low. That was one reason where we do not remove much brain. In our series, uh, maybe out of uh, 40 patients, uh, we have had to do a shunt for only one patient. So, and uh, we do not, I do not put a, Intra uh, ventricular catheter after the surgery as a routine, uh, unless I think there is a uh, there is a problem in hemostasis. Otherwise, these patients uh, usually will have some amount of cerebral edema because of the extensive dissection, and um, did not uh, had to undergo any treatment for acute hydrocephalus. But like I said, we had to do shunt for only one patient, probably out of forty patients. So by percentage, it's anywhere from 2 to 5% now. That's what is described. Whereas it was very high in the era of hemispherectomy. And uh, the second question was, I think, regarding vertical hemispherotomy and perisylvian, right? So I think if uh, when to do vertical and when to do perisylvian. The question is, no, we, we can choose between the two procedures. And I think that uh, for me, you are not audible, bro. Then compared to now, when we perform a vertical para, vertical parameter. So I prefer much more to perform a vertical procedure. I will uh, answer. I'm, I'm sorry again. <laughs> but uh, in, my, what, in my understanding and opinion, I do both. I do both vertical hemispherotomy as well as I do perisylvian hemispherotomy. Uh, if we look at the ease of learning for somebody who is starting to do, uh, I think uh, lateral hemispherotomy will be easier to start in the beginning because if, if a person is doing epilepsy surgery, he is already doing the temporal lobectomy and is exposed to that. And the lateral hemispherotomy can be done even if the ventricles are not dilated as a, in the beginning. So that you can you can uh, you can do the disconnection, you can enter the lateral ventricle, you are allow you can have more space to resect and then do that. Whereas the vertical hemispherotomy is uh, 
is easier in the beginning if you have a dilated ventricle because you are going to operate from the top and the longest distance one has to reach from the uh, from the bone down to the MCF base will be anywhere from 10 to 11 centimeters. So if the ventricle is small, uh, at least for the people who are doing in the beginning, it is going to be difficult to do the procedure because there is not much space uh, available to for retraction of the brain. That is that is when somebody is choosing. Second, as far as the procedure as itself is concerned, ventricular hemispherotomy is more elegant and as simple or has got less disconnections like than uh, than lateral because you don't have to do a temporal lobectomy. The uh, the insular resection is not required because you can do a disconnection from lateral from uh, posterior to anterior, and therefore, uh, if you ask me. Uh, in patients with the large ventricles, vertical hemispherotomy is better and easier. Whereas if you are going to do a, a hemispherotomy in a patient with a very small ventricle, then probably for uh, someone who is not doing it regularly, lateral hemispherotomy is easier. But once you start doing more and more, uh, like you said, we will all move to peri uh, vertical hemispherotomy because it takes less time doing that. Uh, the blood loss is less. And actual disconnections, though you achieve the same disconnection with uh, less amount of uh, uh, incisions. So uh, I think that is the answer for myself. Perfect. We are on the same wave. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was indeed wonderful. Uh, Professor Arunvegan, uh, I just wanted to ask you one specific question, which is very common. In because you deal with so much of epilepsy surgeries and one of the most biggest centers in India with uh, dealing with epilepsy surgery. Now we have seen so many youngsters who want to take up epilepsy surgery, who go for a short stint here and there, three months, four months and come back and they are struggling, still, still struggling to start an epilepsy program. What is your advice for the youngsters who want want to begin an epilepsy center in their place and what is the real actual learning curve for this speciality okay uh, i don't know uh, if you remember i mean this for him if you remember the slides that i've showed if you see my last slide uh, see if you do if you someone is interested in doing spine surgery you can just do spine surgery if someone is interested in doing tumor surgery, you can to probably, I, I mean, I will still not agree as tumor, I know that many people are involved. Whereas when you want to do epilepsy surgery, the surgeon does the surgery, but it is not enough that if the only surgeon is interested, like if you have seen my slide, it involves a team. Unless you have a good team, you will not choose the patients correctly. If your patient's choice is wrong, even if you do a meticulous surgery, your outcome is going to be poor. No patient will accept that. That's the first caveat. I don't think the surgical procedures for drug and epilepsy are very complex. Like you have to go and get trained like in doing a major skull based procedure or clipping or a complex aneurysm or resecting a major AVM. It's not like that. Uh, though what I showed, these procedures are technically demanding like hemispherotomy and, and uh, postcord disconnection. But these are not, these are not the common procedure required for every patient. The common procedures that are required for a patient with regress and epilepsy is usually lesionectomy, which most of new, most neurosurgeons can do with only slight modification. And uh, one needs to uh, learn temporal lobectomy and removal of the hippocampus because like I said, these are the patients who have come to us with seizures. So acceptance of a deficit is going to be very difficult in these patients because one, the patients will not accept. And second, the neurologist who is involved with you will not accept. So you have a patient, you have two consecutive patients with deficit. The third patient will not be will not be referred to you. So that is when the, the error of uh, deficits are less. So you have to take care. So it, it is not difficult to learn this procedure because most of the surgeries are done can be done by a general neurosurgeon who is doing that. For a more for a good beginner, it is enough to start. And uh, surgery after learning proper temporal lobectomy and removal of hippocampus. As far as surgical technique learning is concerned, rest all can be achieved as you uh, start uh, progressing in your uh, series. But what is important is to work and learn to work together with the neurologist and sensitize the patients and identify correct patients and start doing. 
and you don't need any any big uh, major uh, hardware also all that is required is to the your neurologist should be sensitized to identify patients do a video eg good mri to pick up the lesion have a neuropsychology at the basis and consider the patients for surgery and this can be started with just this minimal requirement but it is not enough if just a neurosurgeon decides i want to do flf surgery and then goes around trying to do because it's not it's not possible and the second thing is you need to have a mindset to do this like i said here the surgery is done not to remove a tumor the surgery is done to uh, to remove the epileptogenic focus so you will have to do more investigations and confirm that seizure is coming from there you will have to work with the neurologist to identify how much you have to remove and during surgery you have to do uh, sometimes electrocardiography and all those techniques so that you resect what is required to control seizure and not just stop it like suppose let's say you are doing a cavernoma we will go and remove the cavernoma but if the patient has got a drug resistant epilepsy it will not be sufficient to remove the cavernoma because patient is not going to be happy mri will show no cavernoma but he will continue to have seizures so you should have a mindset at that point to decide that you will do surgery to control seizure and not just remove the lesion so and it's not difficult to get that i think teamwork and a slight fine tuning of the mindset is sufficient well, thank you thank you very much that was a very well explained answer choosing the right center and a right patients matters the most so with that we'll come to the concluding uh, part of this webinar and i'll close this officially on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president prof sir kukat i would like to thank both speakers of today Prof. Sameh El Morsi Hassan and Prof. Arivergan, as well as the Chairs, Prof. Salman Sharif and Prof. Christian Raftopoulos, for their time and support for the ACNS webinars. A very special thanks to Prof. Shubin for for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel, and special thanks to my co-host Dr. Liu Bun Cheng for joining me today. So this is the last webinar of the year 2023, and we are extremely grateful to all of you. who have supported us since last three years so until we meet all on the next saturday in the brand new episode of the new year in 2024 it is bye bye from all of us thank you very much for joining